With most reviews, we're giving our thoughts on a phone or a device after spending about 10 to 14 days with them. And while we get a really good sense of what the device is like to use every day, there's nothing quite like spending a bit longer with it to get a proper feel of how it survives daily use for an extended period. Most recently, I've also got a feel of what iOS 17 brings to the table too. So how has the iPhone 14 Pro survived this past year in my life? Is the ceramic shield screen as durable as Apple says? And is the battery health okay? And is iOS 17 making my experience any better? I'm Cam Bunton from Pocketlint, and in this long-term review, I'm going to answer all of those questions. Now, when you're using a phone for a long time, one of the most crucial elements is durability. It's something that's hard to test when we're reviewing it for just a short period of time, but after 12 months and with a lot of that time without a case or a screen protector, I've managed to get a much better sense of how it handles everyday scrapes and bumps. I will say this, on the whole, I'm pretty impressed. Looking at the outer glass on the front of the phone, there are definitely some light marks, but after 12 months in and out of pockets, probably accidentally with keys and other phones at some point, there's no real deep scratching of any kind. And that's actually more impressive than it sounds because there have been a couple of occasions where the phone has taken a tumble, dropped, and spun onto concrete. I've had similar accidents with cheaper phones and their back or front glass has completely cracked, creating spiderweb patterns all over the glass. But with the iPhone, I might have been a bit lucky here, but the only crack in the glass from those high impact accidents on concrete is a small crack near the bottom corner of the glass on the back, and you can barely see it. So small in fact that I can't feel it when I run my finger along it. What I can feel, however, is the little dents and the marks that those falls have made in the stainless steel frame. And this is why I'm feeling a bit lucky with that front glass, because those marks and indents are all on the front side of the metal frame. One section in the bottom left, one in the top edge, but both on the front. It looks like when it was spinning and landing, it bounced on the front sides of that metal frame, but somehow didn't crack the glass. Now, I'm not saying if you buy one of these, you shouldn't buy a case and a screen protector. I've started using a case again since that tumble, at least when I'm leaving the house. But what I am saying is that on the odd occasion I had an accident, the phone survived relatively unscathed considering the kind of impact that it faced. Now, before I move on, I'd love to hear from you about your experiences with the iPhone 14 or 14 Pro, if you have one. Did I just get lucky or have you found yours is also more impact resistant than before too? Sound off in the comment section down below. Now, what about battery health? Again, for my own use, it's been basically perfect. Now you can find your own on iPhone by going to settings, battery, and then finding battery health and charging. What you find is that when you use and recharge a battery many times over a long period, the maximum amount of battery capacity reduces over time. My maximum is still at 99% of its original capacity, which isn't bad at all, and means I get the same battery life as when it was brand new, pretty much. Now it is worth noting here a couple of things. Obviously as someone who reviews a lot of Android phones, I don't exclusively use my iPhone, but it is the one constant phone I've had with me nearly all of the time and is an essential tool since I work mostly on Mac and have a family that refuses to use anything other than iPhone and iPad and uses AirPlay and Apple TV a lot. There's also the fact that I'm not a particularly heavy user. I'd say I use about two or three hours of screen time a day on my phone and that's usually lightweight tasks like social media, web browsing and reading. There's a few casual games here and there, but I'm not someone who spends all day on phone calls or watches lots of video on my phone. So if you use your phone a lot more than me and end up charging it more frequently, you might find you've lost more than that 1% of battery capacity after a year. As for display quality, general speed and performance and cameras, then nothing's really changed in that regard since I started using it. It's still a fantastic all-round device for media consumption thanks to that excellent 120Hz OLED display and the cameras consistently delivering strong, sharp results with great dynamic range and vibrant colours. The only issue I have with the camera is the same as at the beginning. It really struggles when switching between cameras when it thinks it's close up to an object, whether I'm using the one-time standard view or the two-times digital zoom. Like it gets confused when it thinks it should be using the macro functionality of the ultra wide camera. So if anything, that's even worse now than when I started using it. I have no idea why, but Apple really needs to look at it to make close up photos less of a frustration. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I've been using the iOS 17 beta for the past few weeks to see what the experience of using a year old phone with new software would be like. And unsurprisingly, given the fact that the iPhone 14 Pro's hardware is still highly capable, it almost leaves me feeling that you're not really going to miss all that much from the iPhone 15. Now that said, I also have this clear impression that a lot of what makes iOS 17 new is stuff that's not all that major. 
almost like the additions are secondary features or features that require you to be near another iOS 17 user or at least in communication with another iOS 17 user. Things like swapping numbers with name drop or airdropping files by bringing two phones close to each other require you to be near another iOS 17 user. You can start a share play session with Apple Music too, so you can listen to the same track at the same time with your friend. A lot of these only really benefit iPhone users or people in the Apple ecosystem. There are a couple of nice touches in the software though and how big a deal they are will depend very much on how you use your phone and one of those is standby. It's a new interactive always on screen interface mode that enables you to use your phone when mounted horizontally and charging. The most convenient way is using a MagSafe stand, but you can also use it with a wire charger and a mounting arm or a tripod. Now I primarily used it as a clock to stay at full only while my days slipped away. Of course, I'm kidding, but it is useful as a secondary screen. Probably most useful to me when notifications come in because the entire screen animates with the alert and if it's a message, you can read it there and then without having to reach for it and pick your phone up. If you want, you can then reply as well using Siri. Now it's so much more than just a clock or a notification screen though. You can set it up as a photo frame of sorts, moving through some of your favorite albums and events from the Photos app. Or you can have it as a widget dashboard, combining a clock with calendar events or reminders or any other widget like fitness, weather or battery levels and have a constantly moving dashboard with relevant information to you. Now you might even find you want to change between modes depending on the setting you're in. So at work, you could have the widget dashboard and then on your bedside, just use it as a clock at nighttime. It's pretty flexible. Now in a way, what it feels to me is like Apple is trying to compete with devices like the Echo Show 5 without building its own dedicated assistant device with a screen. It does pretty much exactly the same thing, giving you hands-free access to Siri, weather, reminders, timers, events, the time, photos, and all manner of other things, but in a device that you already own. It's pretty smart. So what else is there? Well, there's the new contact posters and they're pretty cool, letting you make full screen posters and customize text and add a depth effect and color for each contact that you want to. It's certainly less boring than having everyone look the same when they call you. You can also create your own card that shows up on other people's iOS 17 phones when you create it. In messages, there's a new interface for adding stickers, GIFs, animations, pictures, and other elements to your messages, making it less cluttered and simple to use than it was before. Just tap the plus on the side and you can choose to go straight to camera, access photos, stickers, even creating your own bespoke stickers out of photographs or sending voice notes or sharing your location. Hitting more takes you to the third party options that you have installed. Now of all the options, the location sharing is probably the biggest time saver. So you can either share your own location or request the persons that you're talking to and get a big half screen interface from Apple Maps at the bottom of the screen. Now, speaking of maps, you can now download areas for offline storage in Apple Maps, meaning you can navigate anywhere within that space without needing to access data of any kind. If you live somewhere like me, where there are lots of rural spots with narrow winding roads and low signal, you won't always know your way around and it can be a godsend. Now, obviously Google Maps has had this for years, but now there's an alternative. So you don't need to have Google Maps installed on your iPhone, which I guess is Apple's entire play here. Now, there are a lot of other features I'm wanting to try, but they aren't coming out until later this year. So features like collaborating on playlists with Apple Music or using the journal app and sending airdrop transfers via the internet. So you can keep sending the file even if you move your devices away from each other. So there you go. With iPhone 15 series landing, the iPhone 14 Pro has, on the whole, survived the year with no major issues. It's performing as it should and experienced a bit of a new lease of life thanks to iOS 17. Depending on how many changes there are with the iPhone 15 Pro, it might even be worth looking at this older model instead because the needle won't have moved all that far in most ways that matter. Let me know what you think. Do you have your eyes on the new iPhone models or will you be using the launch to save money on this model instead? I've been Cam. You can get me on threads. I'm at Cam Bunton. If you did like this video, please do leave a thumbs up, subscribe and tap the notification bell and I'll see you again in the next one. Bye for now.